Thank you for tuning in to Exeter TV. The meeting will be starting shortly. While we wait, let's learn more about Exeter TV. Exeter TV is the town's public and government access channels, available on Comcast channels 98 and 22. Channel 98 is your channel. If you have an idea for a program, want to host your own talk show, or submit a film, we're here to get your content on television. On Channel 22, we bring you live and replay coverage of government meetings and other town updates. A third channel, Blue Hawk Media, is operated by SAU 16 and can be found on Channel 13 with all your school sports, events, and meetings. You can watch Exeter TV online at exeternh.tv, Apple TV, and on Roku. Find us on social media for extra content. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell to get notified about live streams and new content. Tune in to our platforms every other Friday to watch the Exeter Bi-Weekly Report with recaps of recent events, updates from town departments, and messages from nonprofits in your area. If you head to our website, exeternh.tv, we invite you to sign up to our newsletter to receive monthly updates about new content, upcoming meetings, and more. We'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch Exeter TV and hope that you tune in to our other content as well.
Are you passionate about the environment, land conservation, or our natural resources? The Exeter Conservation Commission is a great volunteer board to get involved in. They meet on the second Tuesday of each month um, at 7 p.m. and we currently have three alternate positions available. The Conservation Commission is responsible for reviewing development plans for impacts to wetlands and wetland buffers. They manage over 2,500 acres of conservation land, oversee a very large and diverse trail network throughout town, and they also host recreation and conservation events throughout the calendar year. We do ask that if you're volunteering for our boards that you commit to at least the monthly meetings. Beyond Beyond those meetings, there are a number of ways to get involved and that's really based on your interest and your um, available time. If you're interested in natural resource protection, consider joining the Conservation Commission. It's a really fun board. They're very engaged. It's a great group of people. So if you have any questions about what the Conservation Commission does or um, areas that they work on, feel free to reach out to me. I'm Kristen Murphy, the Conservation and Sustainability Planner, and I provide staff support to the Conservation Commission. I can be reached by email at kmurphy at exeternh.gov or by phone at 603-418-6452. Thanks a lot, and we hope to see you on our board. If you're interested in learning more or applying to serve on a town board or committee, you can visit the town website for more information, or you can contact Pam McElroy in the town manager's office. She can be reached via email or by calling 603-773-6102. Thank you for watching this video. Thank you for tuning in to Exeter TV. The meeting will be starting shortly. While we wait, let's learn more about Exeter TV. Exeter TV is the town's public and government access channels, available on Comcast channels 98 and 22. Channel 98 is your channel. If you have an idea for a program, want to host your own talk show, or submit a film, we're here to get your content on television. On channel 22, we bring you live and replay coverage of government meetings and other town updates. A third channel, Blue Hawk Media, is operated by SAU 16 and can be found on Channel 13 with all your school sports, events, and meetings. You can watch Exeter TV online at exeternh.tv, Apple TV, and on Roku. Find us on social media for extra content. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell to get notified about live streams and new content. Tune in to our platforms every other Friday to watch the Exeter Bi-Weekly Report with recaps of recent events, updates from town departments, and messages from nonprofits in your area. If you head to our website, exeternh.tv, we invite you to sign up to our newsletter to receive monthly updates about new content, upcoming meetings, and more. We'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch Exeter TV and hope that you tune in to our other content as well.
introduce the uh, other members present today. From my left. Oh, me? You. John Gruder. <laughs> Nancy Belanger. And then coming around to... Oh, Glenn English. <laughs> and to my right, I'm usually to his right, but he's to my right now. That's right. Line Plummer. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and this is welcome to the uh, Master Plan Oversight Committee meeting. Uh -oh. and I'm not talking into it. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> We're still waiting one more of our members, but Nate, why don't we go ahead and start? And All right. We'll let uh, Aaron ca catch up when he gets here. And then watch the tape. And thank you very much for coming, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. So again, I'm Nate Kelly. I know many faces here. Uh, to my left, my colleague, Jeff Davis, a fellow planner and zoning nerd like myself. Um, so uh, we are here just to sort of have our opening conversation. There's not a lot to go over or present, but with that said, our intent is to move pretty quickly on this project as we go forward. Um, the, the, the goal here is, Broadly speaking, to look at Exeter's zoning in a pretty comprehensive manner, um, many of you are involved with the with the master plan development and the the pattern. There's sort of two things happening in Exeter that are really really strong from a planning Nate, perspective. Nate, could I interrupt you for yes. just a moment? I forgot to introduce Dave Sharples, oh, there he is. town planner. Oh. Sorry, David. Sure. So so two things happening in, in Exeter that that are um, probably obvious to all of you but worth stating is when you look at the town sort of up above from a map perspective there's that traditional pattern of development you have a core sort of a, an urban core right there um, that is you know late 19th century um, in post-industrial beautiful main street that's you know survived uh, over the centuries and around that um, you know particularly to the west of the river um, these dense neighborhoods, um, but but human scale, you know, so two story, three story uh, buildings, some larger, some smaller, up to the railroad, up to Lincoln Street, uh, and we're very walkable. Um, and you know, we sort of call that traditional New England design. This really embodies that. And of course, you get further out, and things become a bit more suburban. Um, lots of mature forest, lots of subdivisions, um, and more sparsely developed land. And that pattern of development is considered by you know all the planning books and all the planning schools to be a much more sort of quote unquote sustainable pattern is to try to you know, sort of protect your outlying areas concentrate <laughs> development that was done more out of a practical uh, sense back in the day people needed to be able to walk uh, you know from from place to place that was really the necessity um, and now today we're trying to get back to it because we recognize the environmental benefits, very well documented. Uh, the fiscal benefits is very financially sound uh, from an infrastructure perspective and all the investments that you have to make, um, and public health. So people you know, having better connections. Uh, COVID really put a spotlight on the value of social connection. You know, it's kind of one of those things you don't know what you've got until it's gone. Mm -hmm. And all of the isolation that we experienced through 2020 and 2021, sort of emerging from that now um, these types of neighborhoods are really good for that so folks who lived in these types of neighborhoods through that period um, had an easier go of it because you could see your neighbors outside and, and kind of experience that so lots of great benefits and that's why we're you know trying to reinforce and get back to that so that's one thing that's happening another thing that is maybe a little bit less obvious is the diversity of housing that Exeter has today. Honestly, I've been doing this 22 years. It's pretty stunning. Um, we, Jeff and I, spent the entire day yesterday driving all over this town. I and mean, we've spent a lot of time here anyway. We have an office down on Water Street. But we went all over. We got here at 9 in the morning, and we didn't stop until 3.30 in the afternoon and went through all the outlying neighborhoods, places that we hadn't seen before. And it's pretty remarkable um, that it's hard to find a homogenous neighborhood around here. We saw housing types we've never seen before uh, yesterday. So it was, it was pretty amazing. So... <laughs> Very common in Exeter to walk down a single street and see single family, 
single family tiny, single family medium size, single family large, uh, large houses converted into four or five units, townhouses, side by side, stacked, it's all there. Um, and that is a, an amazing strength from a planning perspective. And it's one of the reasons, you know, we, we do this all over New England. And we talk to a lot of communities about housing diversity as a concept, and they get really nervous. Um, and those communities uh, have pretty homogenous stock. And you talk about housing diversity here, we've been working here on and off for years, and it's people are very comfortable with it because you live it. It's, it's a strength that when we're going, we're looking at zoning, we want to capitalize on that um, and certainly make sure that we don't have any remove any barriers that may be there don't create any unintentional barriers and really allow for some opportunity make sure that we can facilitate that going forward because you know there is a, a nationwide housing crisis um, Exeter has done a tremendous job satisfying your housing needs but it doesn't mean that there isn't room for opportunity and we talked a lot about that um, in the master plan so those are two things that I just sort of wanted to sort of set the stage on um, what we've done to date, um, we have read through the zoning ordinance from front to back. So we did an audit, fell asleep a few times, a few times going through that. It's okay. Um, but, you know, really uh, to do a few things. One was look at areas that may be contradictory to one another. Didn't find a lot of that at all. Um, look for maybe some things where there may have been an obvious difference from what the state law says. Um, found a couple of spots where there were some minor differences, so we called those out. Could be a housekeeping item to think about. Mm -hmm. um, and we identified areas in this uh, particular project. Again, we're going to move fast on this project, so we wanted to identify areas that we're not going to look at. So, for example, this project is not going to look at signage. Um, this, you know, there are there are things that we're doing here that's like, okay, that's for another day, you know, kind of thing. So let's hone in on this issue of concentrating development and, you know, looking for housing opportunity. Those are the the sections that we zeroed in. On. So Dave has a document where we went through when we marked it up and we put some comments in there and things for us to consider that's a reference for us uh, going forward. We did some GIS assessment and Dave's been really helpful doing uh, mapping of what district boundaries might look like going forward, how districts might be renamed, how they might be um, you know, uh, dissolve together. Uh, it's too early in the morning. I can't think of the right word there. Um, but um, you know, we could sort of aggregate some of the some of the districts together. You have a lot of districts. Maybe you don't need so many um, as you have right now. Um, and that was part of the reason why we were out on the road yesterday too, is we had those maps that we've sort of been sketching and, and looking at. And Jeff and I looked at all the potential boundaries and looked at all the neighborhoods and saying, okay, is this the right fit? What about that property over there? What about that property? Is it lying in the right place? So a lot of ground truthing um, went into that. So that's really where we are, um, is, is getting oriented, making sure we understand, um, you know, get a good feel for what's on the ground, get some concepts out on paper, get a feel for the ordinance as it stands today, um, and then we need to move forward in earnest. Um, so that is really kind of a, a sort of a workshopping that Dave and Jeff and I will do behind the scenes um, and bring forward drafting uh, pretty quickly uh, for, for folks to review. We also want to have some public engagement as part of this, we're talking about a like early October, um, early public meeting. Um, again, not necessarily bringing forward a ton of material for people to digest, but to talk about what we're trying to achieve, what we've learned so far, some of the things that we found, some of the ideas that we want to test. Uh, I'm going to have that as a, as an opening public session. Um, so. I'll stop there, and we can talk about some of the ideas uh, that we have, but just wanted to, I've talked a lot and want to open it up for any sort of early questions about the process or what we're trying to, trying to achieve. I don't know, this may be a Dave question, but Could it, be. when is the last time we did something this comprehensive with the zoning? I wasn't here, uh, you know, not since I've been here. 
<laughs> Put it that way. I, I don't even, I wouldn't even gather a guess. I couldn't. Okay. So we, we had something when Sylvia was here that didn't go through. Or we, no, we were just about ready to, to push it ahead and it didn't. Had to do with Portsmouth Ave, I believe. Oh, that was a Portsmouth Ave form based code. Yeah. And I, yeah. I read the entire file on that, okay. but that was specific just to Portsmouth yeah. Ave. Yeah. I mean, uh, that, this will kind of carry that same theme and probably do a lot of the things that was envisioned on yeah. Portsmouth Ave because that is a focus. But when we looked at it, it made more sense if you're doing something that just just kind of look at it more holistically uh, and, yeah. and, you know, and, and do a, a more of a town wide effort once once i got into it and started looking at it so, that was a, so say it's been 20 years if yeah. things changed in your world that much so that what might have been okay 20 years ago we look at a little differently now yeah um i think so what i mean and what doesn't work and you know and and it was funny we were dave and i were just talking about this like right, right before we got started and some of this is out of your control um some of this is statutory right so um we're we're working on an effort in rhode island right now where we're actually like the state is looking at redoing the statutes because they're they're just there's this recognition now, you know, Dave's talking about a lot of these innovative approaches to handling non-conforming lots and yeah. how to reduce the permit burden and how to give situational flexibility, all things that are, that sound really good. And a lot of times the statutes just don't give you the, yeah. you know, you've got like a blunt hammer and then a giant yeah, saw and you're trying to chisel a little piece of wood, you know? so. The, there's some of that that you know we're going to have to deal with as we go through here, and we'll have access to to lawyers who can you know help us sift through that. I mean, and I think you know, but to the stuff you can control, um, a lot of it is the rigidity, you know. So um, there's there's a one size fits all sometimes and and zoning's built that way you have a district right. and you're supposed to have the same setbacks and you're supposed to have the same parking and and so you know it sort of pushes you towards homogeneity and then you've got you walk through a neighborhood out here like right outside these doors and, and out that way nothing's the same the, the lot sizes aren't the same the buildings aren't the same some have parking some have don't and and so and that's great like that's what makes these these neighborhoods so interesting and so that's part of the trick to this is to take a bl what is a, typically a blunt instrument and and refine it. So a lot of tools have emerged, and Dave's been talking about some some ideas on how to deal with these. And sometimes you know the answer is sounds good. We got to ask the lawyer. You know, is is this is this a path that we can go down? Um, so that I mean, that's where the planners really have the strength here. Is they're always pushing the boundaries and trying to meet the planning goals mm -hmm. rather than just comply with the statute. Um, so, so flexibility on the lot per lot, using neighborhood context. So an obvious example um, is like front yard setbacks. So, um, you know, some communities, and I think you may have this provision already in your ordinance, but some communities will say, look, your, your setback is 20 feet and, you know, that's it. Um, but in a historic neighborhood where some people are at five and 20 and 30 and 10. And right. so they'll just say, well, just look over here, look to your left and look to your right and average, right? And that, so that is sort of a quick, okay. you know, kind of trick to, to reinforce the character of that street um, without having this, having to go for a variance and, you know, being stuck with that one number. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of little twists like that. Um, Dave mentioned the sort of the quote unquote, the form based um, code where you know the form of the building gets taken into account you can use some design standards those of you who have seen the MUND that we developed um, you know incorporating some visuals into your zoning to actually tell people what the words mean with, with the picture uh, makes it a lot easier for everybody the regulator the developer the abutter with all of that stuff um, so yeah things have things have come along you know there are new there are new tools um, and you know, I, again, I will report when we, we've done audits, you know, all over New England, 
And it's just been a number of times when, you know, I, I walk into Jeff's office with the ordinance in my hand and I give him that look and he's like, I know, oh my God, this is like, this is a disaster. And this, that's not the case here. Like you've, you've got a pretty good ordinance. There, it's, there's not a lot of mess. There's not a lot of confusion. Um, so I think you've got a solid foundation um, and should be okay. So, could I, Dave, could you just do a really quick overview of why we're here and what we're talking about? Because anyone watching this, we didn't start with that. So, I know it's repetitive because we've all heard it, yep. but I'm thinking of people at home who might watch this. Aaron. <laughs> yeah, I think <laughs> no, it's Aaron. probably Thank about you. started maybe, I don't know, I started mentioning it at the Housing Advisory Committee maybe a year ago or so. I, uh, thereabouts into the planning board to we were experiencing exers since about 2010 or most more recently probably 2016 2017 uh, exer has grown pretty significantly uh, we the the u.s census from 2010 had us at uh i forget how much it was around uh you know 14,700 14, something yeah. and the 2020 has it as like 16,040 we added like 1,700 uh, residents in that 10 year period with probably most of them coming in the second half of that past decade uh, with you know hundreds and hundreds of you know residential units coming online uh, some in you know some in outlying areas some in you know some some in denser areas but it really kind of pushed me to start thinking about okay you know if, if we're going to get this kind of uh, intense development we really probably have to manage it and focus it on where you want it to go from a fiscal and environmental standpoint as as nate uh mentioned because sometimes when you continue that sprawling pattern of of growth uh, it's could be to the town's detriment in a lot of factors so i started looking at it like okay you know we you know, if we want to grow, it seems like, you know, people want to have growth and our zoning ordinance allows growth right now. And there's always a, a say, you know, uh, you can go, there's always the option to go to the ZBA and get a variance to not meet the, you know, requirements of the ordinance. Uh, so we felt it was a, it, I felt it was time, it was a ripe time to look at in the entire of Exeter, look at, you know, townwide and, and figure out where do we want growth, where do, you know, where do we want to preserve, what's the character of Exeter, you know, keep that and, and balance kind of growth and, and the character of Exeter. Uh, and from an eye of fiscal and environmental, you know, responsibility. So <clears throat> I started thinking about that. We talked about it at the planning board, the housing advisory committee. I think everyone was on board with that, with that you know, basic idea uh, of why to do it. We started working with it. I had some studies money. I have $5,000 in studies money. So I hired Horsley Witten Group to, to, to start do that. Uh, then it became, it quickly became pr pretty obvious that, you know, this was a, a lot larger project uh, than that and uh, but then an Invest New Hampshire grant came up so I was kind of almost like okay you know maybe this warrant in a town we you know we have to go, to do these things we go once a year in March and so uh, I was working on it through the summer it just didn't seem in the uh, you know feasible to you know ramp it up enough uh, with the time you know and the bandwidth we have uh, but then an Invest New Hampshire grant came along I applied for it in August got it got you know uh and and got and and Jose Witten's on board uh with it to ramp it up and hopefully meet the March 2023 warrant however I mean we did say quickly and fast but I am not going to sacrifice the public engagement in the process for speed so uh, I, but on the same side we just got the grant and if we can do it we would like to because yeah. in a town you're kind of if you don't get on march 23 then you're 24 you kind of sit on your hands lose the momentum people forget you know and then you have to ramp it up again you know the following year yeah. at this time of year so <laughs> i think we have the time but i'm not going to say you know I think let the process play out, uh, but that's the goal. So is that does that answer your question? That's it, why yeah, we're here. It, it's more I've, for trying to educate the public. Yeah. Last night, plan at the budget, there was still comments that we're not communicating well. So hmm. this was an opportunity to reinforce what we're doing and why. And also, while I've been here, you know, the six years I was here, I've noticed some things that you know how the ordinances applied that. 
and people go through a process, sometimes just for the sake of process. If it has, if mm -hmm. there's a reasonable outcome to, for the process, then um, for it. But there's, I, I believe, my personal opinion, I've expressed this, is, is there should be some flexibility where flexibility is needed and common sense and so forth uh, instead of rigid setback lines. Like Nate mentioned, that's a perfect example about the setbacks. We, in the C1 and the WC, we have this, what's the average of the block? That's the setbacks you have to meet, which is great. And, 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 uh, and one of them is also, what's your neighbor? The side setbacks is like the front and rear setbacks is the average. The uh, side setbacks are whatever your neighbor is. So if your neighbor is, you know, five feet from the property line, you get to go five feet from the property, which, which seems like, you know, that's a flexible approach. But in all other zoning districts, it's a rigid 25, you know, say it's 25 front, regardless of what's on the ground. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these neighborhoods got built in, you know, say they got built in the 40s, 50s or earlier, you know, pre-zoning and they're 5,000 square foot lots. And now the current zoning requires 40,000 square feet and the setbacks for 40,000 square feet apply. That's not really reasonable reasonable because they don't have 40 they have a lot that's you know a quarter of the size of, of the minimum zone but yet they have to meet the same larger setback so as a percentage of their property taken away from setbacks is much greater uh, than if they were a lot that complies you, you follow me there's a lot of area they just can't use so it, it's just it doesn't so that's kind of a goal too you know that's just one example of the things I saw but then it bleeds into everything and it ended up becoming a town-wide effort because of that because I think we have a lot of those uh, um, you know, uh, issues or yeah. concerns that I have in this document. Well, I can't articulate this as well as you can, but at the Housing Advisory Committee, um, you explained the fiscal part, the, the financial part of looking at our core urban development versus how much it costs to develop outside of that. So I think that's something that we'll probably want to reinforce a few times with the data. Yeah, and also we are looking at capacity because it's about capacity, uh, you know, how much a town can actually accommodate. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have, you know, water water capacity, sewer capacity, transportation network capacity, uh, natural resource capacity. That's a big one because it's one of the capacities that you really can't, once you lose it, you can't add more. Like right. school capacity, well, if you're at school capacity, you could always do a capital improvement program and add an addition and hire more personnel and actually add capacity. But natural resource capacity isn't like that. You, yeah. you know, you, it's it's pretty much that's that's it. You know, you're not you're not getting that back. But we are so also looking at the capacity, and I thank you for bringing that up. It's like, okay, we have so much capacity before you have to make large capital improvement. Uh, you know investments which are a town decision but but we do it looks like we do have capacity in most of those areas but where do you want to absorb that growth to use that capacity and do you want it in greenfield development where you know you're, you might be at the detriment of losing your natural resource capacities or do you want to promote and move it to infill development redevelopment which admittedly is tougher uh you know that's why people go out and do greenfields because it's easier just mm -hmm. to you know build and and but if you get that infill development it it's so much uh, like I said on that walk we, we did an example of the of a property out here on Front Street and they added 11 units to the town without adding you know one foot of roadway one foot of okay. thing no drainage and prudent didn't cut down any trees no wetland buffer encroachments mm -hmm. and they added those units and the value to the town and the tax base yes it adds people that it use services but that's the same regardless of where you put them and there's so many advantages to infill development it's worth looking Looking at how do you steer development and incentivize and like Nate made a good point we don't control everything right. you know land cost profitability we don't have it but we can just try our best to put a you know put regulations in place that incentivize and give a, a, a you know some incentive to developers to like say okay you know I can go here or here but the zoning is such that this makes sense so I'm, I'm going to go over here that's what we're trying to achieve and we can't force people you know we can't say but we can regulate to try to make it more of an incentive and steer growth where we want to see it and that walk will be available on Exeter TV tomorrow mm -hmm. Exeter TV video recorded it it was the housing advisory and other partners mm -hmm. um that we had last Thursday, the week a week ago Thursday. I'm losing track, but yes, that will be available. Fascinating walk with your information. Thank you.
And then the other main point why we're here is really to introduce it to you folks. You've been here a long time. You all, you, you all live here and get some feedback from you on specific, general, anything. Because uh, we're, you know, it's kind of a almost a blank slate here that we have. I mean, we looked at the zoning, like, you know, just the town of Exeter, and I drew different zones a lot, you know, where I thought were that didn't. I mean, some of them follow the existing zone lines, but some don't. So looking for information and input from you on because we're just getting started on on this and mm -hmm. so this is a good time to hear some feedback from you folks well i would say from my short experience of the board uh, many of the zoning changes have been brought through developers uh to make it happen you know such as the businesses up front and, and residential out back and you know picking up in other parts of town but again developers finding a, a piece of land but the zoning wasn't quite right so a year later we got it ready and they come in with a plan so that's been but this is sort of a reverse process we were trying to get we want to have well the same thing it's controlling developers basically the zonings but this is to try and encourage them to use as you're saying one place and another that makes a lot of sense so we're 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 looking further down the road being prepared for it rather than just letting it happen and say oh, we need to make a little difference in this zone three over here to allow that to happen i like that yeah and then it won't yeah. completely solve i you know because no. there's always the op uh, opportunity for a variance and we can plan it is tough to plan with capacity and so forth when if someone goes and and can get variances for hundreds of units uh, you know, it, it, it can throw a little bit of <laughs> a wrench in planning because that's, you don't expect it. How do you, how do you know that corridor? And there's sewer, watershed, you know, water uh, capacities, you know, transportation network capacities uh, that when, if it gets to the planning board, we have to deal with. Uh, and uh, so we're, we're trying to identify all those capacities and, and hopefully knowledge. So, so this is what we want and moving forward, they might be, you know, yeah. uh, hopefully adhere to you know, the variance requests will be less, potentially. Yeah, because basically we don't want to run the town on variances, no. I don't think. No. Uh, that's not the way to... doesn't want to. <laughs> Nobody does. Right. The, but, the way that's saying the zoning is not appropriate for that area. Or, yeah. But if we're not careful, and yeah. if we don't, do, don't address this, yeah. variances will become the norm as opposed to the exception. I may have overstated that. Mm -hmm. well, I thought it was well said. A possibility. Speaking of that, how, how, I know this is the master plan subcommittee, but how has the zoning board been, um, what's their involvement in this, if any, at this point? I, we had asked for a group, we had talked about a joint meeting with the zoning board and planning board. Uh, what came of it, we ended up meeting with the chair uh, and uh, the chair, the chair and vice chair of the planning board met with the chair of the zoning board. And it was decided that they would, they would, the chair would go to the zoning board and ask the zoning board for a couple of members that would be willing to volunteer that would kind of come, you know, as a, as like a workshop and get involved with staff and, and the chairs of the planning board and work together just to make sure they're through this process, their, their thoughts, concerns are kind of fleshed out because they deal with the zoning ordinance all the time. That's what they, that's what they um, review and act upon and their decisions are based on the language and the zoning ordinance. So, uh, I am awaiting a return from that about those uh, from those folks. I don't know if he attended the last meeting or not, so I'm not sure he got that opportunity. Because the other thing is with these boards, they meet once a month, and if you miss a month, it's a couple months out. But I will, uh, we will stay on that and try to get them involved. So and they, you know, chair has shown a willingness to yeah. to participate in it. So. So that walk we did, I'm sure you probably know about it, but it was to show people our diversity. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll, so we'll look at that too. So thank you for recognizing that. I'm, I know you're the professional, yeah, it, so it's good to hear it from you too. And, and, and you know, we went in some of the outlying neighborhoods. There was more, you could tell it was, you know, maybe a circa 1970s subdivision. And it was, you know, a lot of ranches. It was more homogenous, but that's sort of like development that was a little bit later on. But those are some of the questions we were asking ourselves is which of these neighborhoods 
you know, should we look at as something that can really evolve over time, that's meant to evolve over time, and which neighborhoods probably not so much, you know, and, and so those are a lot of the discussions in the car yesterday as we were sort of driving through these different spots. Mm. Well, I know the Housing Advisory Committee was really excited when Mr. Sharples brought this up to us, so yep. I'm glad to see it's progressing at this level. Yep. Well, I mean, our next steps are to start to organize some public discussion. Um, and again, to, to continue to workshop, and, and Dave and Jeff and I will be on the phone every week, I'm sure, going forward, um, talking either about the language we're drafting or who we have to speak with next um, to get some input. Yeah, I think we have a few months, October, November, December. You know, we got a few months to really flush this out. Um, so we do the survey, and I mean, can we involve make zoning changes I mean if I already own a piece of land that's commercial and you want to you can't change that right yeah you can I don't know why I don't think I envision any you know commercial zone land going we're not looking at that but well, or, or, no. or the other way around residential to commercial uh, we've done an analysis yeah. of which zones today would be in uh, the new zones and Continue what percentage to, of that plan yeah. uh, so we can share that with you. There are some instances where, for example, you've got something zoned commercial can today. You speak but, to the mic. Oh, sorry. <laughs> We're there are examples where you have uh, something that's zoned commercial today, um, but for example, it's all conservation land. And so David proposed, all right, well, this is actually going to be neighborhood preservation. It's not actually used for commercial purposes today. So there are some instances yeah. where, uh, but by and large, and that's, again, one of the reasons that Nate and I went out yesterday was to ground truth those lines on the map and to make sure that they were, there was as little disruption as possible between those residential and, and commercial uses where they're distinct. Uh, and one of the major things that we're still grappling with is where mixed use is okay and where you would want a variety of different types of uses and how to handle that. Yeah, and and to, this is a specific example. A lot of the neighborhoods, you know, just take High Street, for example. You go out High Street, there's, you know, there's a lot of dead-end streets mm -hmm. off yep. of that and yep. cul-de-sacs. Those neighborhoods are pretty much established. Yeah. Yeah. Those, you know, the, they're they're outside of the, you know, what I would call the urban core. Uh, those shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't open necessarily those up or, or change those to commercial. But somewhere along along main corridors, there's and pretty much everyone in Exeter, there's a mix of residential, yes. single-family, commercial use, you know, a market, uh, you know, even in a light industrial facility out on Hampton Road. I mean, yeah. there's a single family home, light industrial use, uh, you know, a duplex, and then a market. Yeah. Uh, and then, a, and then a, I forget what the use is there, but it's a commercial use, single family home, and then a commercial use. So yeah. it, there is a, so we'd look at those places to, maybe if they're strictly residential now, we would allow mixed uses to recognize what's there. Not necessarily change it. You, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah, okay. change it from what it is. Saying okay, strictly residential. This is a residential neighborhood, and we're gonna we're gonna allow everything. No, that's not uh, that's not something we're thinking. And that's when we get okay. back to the discussion of form. So like one of the, it gets very jargony the, the language, but you know, we look at those streets, and the reason why that doesn't feel off when you're on those streets and it's commercial, residential, you know, industrial, is because of the scale of the buildings and where the buildings are kind of situated on the lot and yep. the way they all work together. So the street feels cohesive. And so like that, that's an example of how we're sort of thinking differently a little bit about zoning is not necessarily the use and the setback and the parking and all of that stuff is like okay let's step back and what does this street look like and it's probably fine to have a dentist and a veterinarian and a two family and you know and so forth all the way down because it it just sort of feels the feels right the scale and the and the and the street and the configuration it all sort of feels right yep. so that's a sort of a different way to think about zoning mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you and then is it 
I'll say having been involved with the courts with that new form based code project, um, it became a, it became really challenging because it's very subjective. And I'm I'm seeing that that could be problem. I mean, I love the idea, but I also <laughs> executing it and, and right. So it seems like a real challenge. Yeah. So for the folks at home, you know, talking about flexibility. Um, and subjectivity of you know what a street feels like and what the buildings look like and and that sort of thing and that gets back to you know what are the tools that were given by statute so one of the other things that we have to identify is what permit process is the best fit for this so you know by statute we, we again we got a blunt set of you know limited set of tools we've got variances conditional use permits by right um, you know, there's site plan review and there's special permits and those kind of weave over each other too. They can overlap. So part of what we're thinking about is where can we apply the right permit process in order to have a meaningful discussion about meeting the standards of the ordinance if there is some subjectivity if there is some vagary if we've just just given you a box to work in but haven't painted the picture which permit process will allow you to paint the right picture with the developer right and so for example with the mixed use neighborhood development when we talked that through we thought okay the conditional use permit is the right way to go here because you can legally condition how this moves forward and you're having a discussion with the planning board um, but if the developer meets all the requirements of the ordinance you are obligated to approve so there's a there's a burden on both the developer and the town to make this work uh, through that permit process. Yeah. So that's just an example of how that plays out. And I know, I mean, it's funny you mentioned Portsmouth Ave, because Portsmouth Ave is very, it's very interesting. It's very, one of the, pretty much, I look at it like, you know, definitely an opportunity zone, because you have the, the transportation network capacity there is, is better than any, any other road in Exeter maybe except 101, you know, that doesn't have any traffic lights. But I mean, sometimes, you know, it, it varies. You kind of go from a two lane and then you, you know, you grow out and you get a center turn lane and then, you know, you get uh, like, oh, I think it's like eight lanes when you get out to the town line. So it, it is like a little bit of a funnel, but we've got a lot of transportation network capacity out there. We've got a lot of impervious surface areas, some underutilized parcels. It's like kind of low, you know, single story strip development, but you, you know, pretty much strip development from alumni drive to to, uh, to the town line. But there is a nice, very nice multifamily um, condo complex out there right by the, right by the reservoir. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of opportunity there. That could, that's a place that could, see, you could see a lot of change out there potentially on Portsmouth Ave. I mean, sewer capacity is an issue on that because there are some lines and then we got the pump station and the siphon that goes under the, on, under the way, but there is some capacity and we're working on that. Uh, but that's definitely an opportunity for things maybe to change. You'd, you'd see some change there, particularly with a, you know, same with a form based code. Uh, Portsmouth could, you know, Portsmouth Ave could dramatically change, but it seems like, you know, we got all the infrastructure there uh, you know we have lighted intersections without you know creating another Portsmouth Ave somewhere you know take advantage of kind of the infrastructure you have that's kind of the impetus behind this whole thing um, and we saw that happen when stop and shop came in and it really was a rebuilding of the neighborhood and it's great improvement all around mm -hmm. it works yeah. so one thing I'd love to ask of the group um, you know, given uh, you're all longtime residents here, you understand the community, you know what causes controversy, what people are generally comfortable with. I know you had your experience with uh, the Portsmouth Ave form-based code. What are some of the uh, things that we should be aware of or looking out for uh, as potential things that might make people nervous, might make people come to a public hearing and say, what's going on? You know, what, what do we need to get out in front of and be aware of culturally or just things that people care about uh, that we might need to be aware of? Bandstand? <laughs> well, well, I for one yeah. probably, John and I have lived here, well, I don't know, how long have you lived here? I've lived here 12 years. I've only been here seven. So we're not necessarily in that spot, but that young lady over there and the gentleman to my right have been here a couple of years. 
a few years. Yeah. Since the founding, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and, missed, and excuse me, all the way down at the by far left. I was born here. Yes, she was, okay, she's the winner. So I, I think that, that I can't really answer your concern because I'm not a long time resident. However, what I've seen in the short period of time that I've been here has been puzzling. Now, I came basically from a small town in northwestern Connecticut a long time ago, uh, which I don't even recognize now. I think one of the benefits of Exeter is that you all recognize the town as, it, as you have a memory of it, and it really may not, other than the outlier, outlying areas, it may not have changed that much. And that's, a, that's something that, yeah. that I think is going to be important because there are those who, are, who envision change, and then there are those, I think, who uh, the status quo, for, uh, may, they may not understand that, but the mere fact that they've grown up and they're comfortable with, I mean, I've adopted this as my hometown, or my wife and I have. Um, I knew it many years ago, because I lived in Bedford for um, a number of years, which if you want to think about a town that got, uh, some of you may be aware that Bedford was a very small town mm -hmm. not too many years ago. Oh. And you don't, I don't even, rec I get lost at times when I go back. I think here in Exeter, you'll never get lost if you've been here for well, a period of time. You know, I remember, because I grew up in New Hampshire, but coming through Exeter to get to Hampton Beach, and one of the nice things is it hasn't, downtown hasn't really changed yeah, much at it, all. Oh. And, and this is, you're, you're going to need to find those folks who have lived here a long time, and as John has just suggested, it's been the same. Mm. Maybe now you're having a lot of people start to grumble, well, things don't move, you get stuck, you can't get through town, uh, you can't find a place to park. Oh, I'm sorry, we don't need to go into that at this point. <laughs> but it does seem to me that that this, the public has got to be brought in. You've got to get the, I call, no, I won't call it the old folks. I'll call it the, the settled folks. You've got to get to them as well as those who are younger and more interested in seeing Exeter change. Now, I may have overstated that. Or grow, grow uh, in a planned manner. Yes. Not necessarily change. No, no, no. But when different. I say change, I'm not talking yes. about just... Just right. throwing things. Yep, yep. But it seems to me that, that um, hmm. to, when we go to the public, we've got to be able to get at both of those constituencies, if you will. Yep. Mm -hmm. And, well, that's what you, that's why you're professionals <laughs> and why I'm a broken down lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> so if I can just add that, I gr having grown up here, we didn't have to have a car, right? We had our markets in every neighborhood. We had mixed use. Store owners had their stores downstairs and lived upstairs. Yep. If they prospered, they bought a house somewhere and rented their apartments upstairs. That's our history. We had neighborhoods, Charter Street, that whole area. That was built because the mills came in and three people in town, businessmen, decided that they needed to provide housing for the mill workers. Um, you know, dam goes out. It helps to revitalize Franklin Street. Thanks, because yep. everything was being flooded in that area. Um, but you know, parking, traffic, I think can be a problem. I know I get stuck in traffic coming into town at night, um, but all doable. There, there are gonna be solutions that we can find. Mm -hmm. To, to deal with the parking, the traffic. Um, we just need to start with this project and then see where we want to go and then, I don't know, is that a side look? Once we get the report, we can then look and see what the traffic patterns might change or something like that. So I'm excited. I'm, I, I love this opportunity to 
relook at everything. Great. Yeah, there's, it's, it's really complicated, right? It's, zoning is one piece of the puzzle, and that's one of the, the messages we like to get out early, is that you know, folks who may fear change think that you're gonna change the zoning and the developers are just gonna like descend on, on your community, and, and you know, it just doesn't happen that way. Yeah. Zoning is one piece of a very complicated puzzle, mm -hmm. um, traffic, parking, Schools, water, sewer, land cost. Now, now, we're, now we all are experts on supply chain, right? Like, right. because the world's completely changed in that regard. So, yeah, all of these things figure into it. Um, and again, it's about what what the town can control and what they can't control or what they can help with and what they can't help with. And zoning is something that's squarely in the town's wheelhouse. So that's why we often start there is to get that house in order and then start working on these issues where you can. But I think you have a problem. No, I, I think there is a problem that you, zoning's not understood by a vast number of people. No, you don't. They don't understand. They, 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 they'll go out Portsmouth Avenue, for instance. They don't understand what zoning how zoning impacted or didn't what Portsmouth Avenue is. Mm -hmm. And I think we have an educational problem, all of us, mm -hmm. the planning board and new folks and the housing authority, uh, uh, HAC. We, we, I, I think we have not made zoning understandable. Now, I may be terribly wrong when I say this, but I would be willing to bet that where I live, 90% of the folks there don't understand what zoning is. No, nor do they need to, though. But nor do they need to. <laughs> but, again, but again, but again, it's, yeah, it's important yeah, what we think of this Exeter overall and how we're going to be able to sell this. Mm -hmm. Fundamental is an understanding of what zoning is. Yeah. And I don't. I just don't have the feeling that that the vast majority of people understand the benefits of zoning. Yeah. They view it perhaps as restrictive, but we're going to be able to hopefully make zoning a tool for good rather than a tool of uh, suppression. Now, I may, again may have overstated this, but I think yeah, this is part of what we're we're about to start down the road on is uh, getting people to understand. And I, th I, 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 as I say, repetitiveness. That's, be, that's what we have to do. We have to repeat what Dave's doing, yeah. what the the idea behind it, where it started, where we're going, and then every step of the way. Because, because all we can do is educate and put it out there. Yes, because what's going to happen? People think, oh, they're trying to do something. They're trying to, trying to. Well, they I'll think see. they know more than than uh, the average person, and that's that's a, that, that's going to be a hurdle we've got to get over. I think. Well, how's it going to affect my taxes? That's yeah. a big question. But it's it's something you don't get involved with unless you get a letter saying the butter's going to be doing something. Right. So and then then you do a crash course in it, but. Uh, but I, I think um, if we can um, encourage people to think of the big picture, I'm, I'm a big picture guy. I like the, you know, when developers come in and show me a picture of where this is happening, I love it because I can see it. It's the way this brain works. But the big picture here is to look at the whole thing, a holistic approach. Mm -hmm. We've done this. I mean, typically the old model, we'll do this because we got this little project going there and we need to do that, so we do that. And, then we, and we look for something else to improve, so we'll try that. We'll do it, we're spot, spot zoning, you know, kind of in a way, Dave, you know. It's time to step back and look at the whole thing. It's just what you're talking about. Uh, so that may help. But yeah, we gotta have a one-on-one -on -one zoning. What's it all about? An introductory thing of some kind or other, yeah. But anyway. Exeter TV and a video. 
the start. They're doing great with communication. Oh, yeah. Trying to up our yeah. game. Yeah. They use, really are. Use our so, talent and find us, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. When Bob yeah. Glowacki comes back from vacation, we'll ask him some thoughts. Pictures are worth I, a thousand I, words. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, they did an excellent job on the fire and police department. Yeah, so uh, it's, it's you have to lose creativity of how you show those things. But that's what we're talking about is all part of this process. Yeah, so yes, it is. We're educating. Yeah. Well, so we, walk, we get we to a certain point. Tom there a couple tears. days ago. I mean, two weeks ago, it was great. Same idea. We looked at all it. Dave had all the information, and and uh, Doug also. Yeah. Had helped in with that. That so. walk, it was incredible. It was. But well, we've got to learn how to. Us. We have to learn how to walk before we can run. That's, I think, where yeah. Dave yes. came okay. from earlier. But I'm, but I'm saying yeah. this becomes very important. Yes. Yep. Okay, just, just want to, I mean, I'm, I hate to back up, but I uh, just want to touch on, you know, the traffic and, uh, and parking, and I know that's been, you know, a topic that uh, <laughs> has come up. But we, we, we are working on a bike and pedestrian master plan mm -hmm. right now with our with the Rockingham Planning Commission looking at town-wide looking yep. at those networks to get around uh, to be able to not just recreate but also you know daily errands or trips you know that might be a car you know alternate providing alternative ways uh, for folks uh, to to do the make those trips without a vehicle but also where putting on the 2023 uh, warrant got presented to the budget review committee. The town manager presented his budget and wants to put forward what the planning board recommended, the parking and traffic uh, pedestrian flow analysis for the downtown. And while mm -hmm. we, we do have, you know, there are some, you know, traffic issues and some backup issues, but I wouldn't jump to the conclusion that it's all about growth in Exeter because uh, some of it is, is about desirability of Exeter because mm -hmm. what I'll see living here you know and taking a lot of traffic counts is like Thursday is is just like boom you know you, you can't find a parking spot on Thursday afternoon for past 11 I'm like well why is that it's probably not it's a lot of it's the farmers market where people are coming out from other places and desirability it's yep. surrounding towns that have growth that come to Exeter to have lunch and and fe feed this area and you know and the economy and the vibrancy of this area so it's almost like a catch-22. It's like you, you don't want to lose that because no. if you lost that, then you'd drive right through. <laughs> you wouldn't have the backup. <laughs> but it's it's the vibrancy and the desirability of Exeter. I hear that from a lot of people. And my daughter comes here for lunch all the time. She loves, you know, she loves those few yeah. places here. And my wife does. I mean, I, you know, yeah, so. I don't know where the traffic is coming from coming in, yeah. but it's, it's for people going to our restaurants. We have great choices of restaurants yeah. now. Uh, there's a lot of reasons. It's not people mm -hmm. coming home at night like me. Or yeah. trying to rush to a meeting. Right? All growth in Exeter and projects yeah. do affect and can impact traffic, but yeah. we take those, uh, you know, best we can on a case by case at the planning board. We ask for traffic impact studies. We evaluate it. We impose exactions mm -hmm. for offsite improvements mm -hmm. as necessary. We've we've done all that. We ask for center turn lanes where appropriate. I mean, we've done all that, and that's that's the best we can do with that. But we are taking at the planning board level, we are taking a holistic approach and looking at it yeah. uh, to hopefully keep that vibe emergency alive yeah. and from a select board member perspective and being on the planning board as that capacity with a development with where we have some development coming with no parking and I've been able to have a conversation with the Department of Public Works who is really positive about ways we can handle this so we have a temporary possible solution coming up for and that's mostly because of our winter ban our winter parking ban. We want That's our current yeah. residents and new ones to have a place to park during the parking ban. So it's great. We if we're collaborating, we're trying to find solutions to potential problems, and you know, and stick with trying to keep environmentally sustainability sound. And so anyway, I think it's a great start. I'm excited about this project. It's, it's great. So everyone agrees kind of with our philosophy, our yeah. next step, our approach yeah. to this. Yeah. And uh, what's the, what are we shooting for the planning board? For, for un, talk to, uh, the 11th, 13th? Well, 13th? 12th, 13th. The October 13th. <coughs> yeah, we do have a light agenda that night. So uh, we're thinking about putting this on and at the at the yeah. planning board level and we'll have more for you maybe something solid to, yeah, we to start to look at yeah. well it, but interestingly enough you've got four planning board members right here yeah. already <laughs> yes. yes the 13th 
Well, well, actually five. Five. <laughs> so we're almost we've got a quorum. Right. Yes. <laughs> but this is a master plan oversight committee meeting when the yes, members the members true. were earlier. The members are you and well Pete and John. Right. Yeah. And the the rest we just told the planning board about it, and they're joining us Cheers, as, here as public. The committee works properly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm what glad time are those meetings? Seven. Uh, seven. But seven. we can. I mean, we can talk about it now if there's some reason to, you know, start earlier. But we do have an agenda item at seven. So, and we we only have one agenda item on the October thirteenth. So, it should be fairly yeah. straightforward. So we have a fifteen minute agenda item or an hour. We're gonna take it out. Well, that's, that's up it. to that's you. Well. <laughs> I mean, you, can, you can make an educated. It's case. a compliance with conditions of approval. Um, so it should be, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't be, be that long of a discussion. Okay. Um, yeah. And that sounds like a good night to do it if you guys yeah. are, are ready. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah it looks it like they had it on their schedule. And we're okay to start at seven. Still, everyone's yeah. thinking. Uh, so the fine. only problem with starting earlier, it's, it's like you have to guess exactly what, how mm -hmm. long you'd be. Got it. And yes. and because then you, at seven o'clock you have to start the regular meeting, get onto the regular agenda. You don't want to push them off. Yeah. So if we're comfortable with it, that's why I'd probably go. Because then if we want, if we feel like staying a couple hours and hammering this out, we can because there's nothing on the backside. Right. Nothing coming up past yeah. that. So, I. Yeah, I yeah. mean, we've. I think that works. I think that yeah. works. that worked, Mr. Chairman. Like Matt, oh, absolutely. Might, <laughs> <laughs> you never know how late we'll be. Here. Well, we've been enjoying light agendas lately, so yeah. we're, we're ready to go. We have. <laughs> for right. exciting presentation that we can interact with. See. Well, I also have a feeling that more people may tend to watch a planning board meeting than this type of a meeting in the morning. But who knows? Who knows? I don't know. Yeah. Some of the comments we'll that we had at the budget recommendation committee meeting last night were not really encouraging <laughs> when it comes to that. I thought more because we have so many options for people to watch, and I'm hearing that that's not working out so well. But yeah. no. it's just hearing it. But they have the option. They have the that. option. I know. So, I, yeah. I don't yeah. know yeah. what to do. Should I have going people? door to door? I don't know how else we can. But we'll keep working on it. Yeah, just keep yeah. doing it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay, well, this seems to be... Great. Okay. Sounds Thank good. you. Thank you. Good to see you all. Are you Meeting done? adjourned. Are we done? Oh, no, we're done. As far as we have the gavel. Oh, I have yeah. I'll, make a, I'll make a motion to adjourn. Hey, thank you. You have to second it because there's only the two. Second. Well, you second the motion. Oh, you guys, no, you guys are on the that's committee. Right. Oh, that's yeah. right. Second. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> all, all in favor? Aye. Fine. Aye. I've been... Thank you for tuning in to Exeter TV. Exeter TV is the town's public and government access channels, available on Comcast channels 98 and 22. Channel 98 is your channel. If you have an idea for a program, want to host your own talk show, or submit a film, we're here to get your content on television. On channel 22, we bring you live and replay coverage of government meetings and other town updates. A third channel, Blue Hawk Media, is operated by SAU 16 and can be found on Channel 13 with all your school sports, events, and meetings. You can watch Exeter TV online at exeternh.tv, Apple TV, and on Roku. Find us on social media for extra content. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell to get notified about live streams and new content. Tune in to our platforms every other Friday to watch the Exeter Bi-Weekly Report with recaps of recent events, updates from town departments, and messages from nonprofits in your area. If you head to our website, exeternh.tv, we invite you to sign up to our newsletter to receive monthly updates about new content, upcoming meetings, and more. We'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch Exeter TV and hope that you tune in to our other content as well.